This was not a religious event out in the hills of Bethlehem. It was a secular event, right? It was. It was like a football game, an NFL football game, except they were shepherding sheep. And out of nowhere, the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah glory comes, and an angel visits them, and then there's a, a multitude of angels worshiping and praising God and giving glory to God in the highest. And so sometimes the most unlikely places God shows up in your life. Look for that. Expect for that. And the most unlikely times he talks to you. I have seen your love shine brighter than the sun. I have seen you change the world. Well, let's read it together again. We're back at Luke chapter 2. And let's begin with verse number 8. Luke. If you're looking for Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Chapter 2, verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock. By night, and behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone, shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you, you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the sayings which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at all those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then, verse 20, the shepherds returned, glorifying God and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it was told to them. All the things that they had heard and seen. And uh, certainly that is two very important things for us, that we hear and we see. Believing is seen, right? For we look not at the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And so, Lord, open our eyes and to see into that unseen realm or world where the kingdom of God exists, where God dwells and God rules and reigns. And to experience the fullness of that realm in our lives. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for the word. We pray now, Lord, as we recount and uh, go back over the details of the Christmas story, that, Lord, you enlighten us, that you give us new insight, Lord, that we would uh, take this story and that it would captivate our hearts and motivate us to tell others about Jesus. And uh, to not be shy or ashamed, but to tell others the good news that Christ is born. The Savior, Lord Jesus, has been born uh, in Bethlehem. We give praise now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, praise God. Um, that legendary, legendary passage of scripture that we just read was immortalized by in the classic animated TV show, which we just saw, A Charlie Brown Christmas. And when Linus quoted this passage from Luke's Gospel in response to Charlie Brown's question, isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? And remember Linus, after he finished reading the passage, said, Charlie Brown, that's what Christmas is all about. What a profound statement, you know? I don't know how many words in that little phrase. But that's really what Christmas is all about. And as I mentioned earlier when we opened the service, that this time of year there's a, there's a joy that exists. That God gave a gift of joy to the world that uh, centers around the birth of his son. And so it's to all people, to all religions, to everyone on earth, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. God has given the gift of joy in the celebration of the birth of his son to all people. Now, do all people recognize the birth of Jesus Christ? No. But, but they do come in contact with this joy, this feeling, this goodwill feeling. And that's in celebration of Christ's birth. And so what a great opportunity is to talk to people about, hey, feeling pretty good? <laughs> you got some joy in your heart? It's a good time of year, isn't it? And, and, and uh, tell people, hey, you know what it's really all about? It's all about the birth of Jesus and the gift of joy that God gave to this planet. And it's about receiving that gift and calling on the name of the Lord. The Bible says you will be saved. So this is a great time of year to tell others about Jesus. So many times we just forget, you know, to tell somebody. But uh, you never know whose life you're going to change by just 
uh, proclaiming the good news that Jesus Christ has been born in Bethlehem. The Christmas, though, uh, is about so much more than just that. Uh, there are a lot of interesting stories that wrap around the birth of Christ. And we're, in the next few weeks, we're going to take a look at those stories. But we're going to begin today with angels and shepherds. You know, I, I think in the world, there are a lot of contrasts that exist. And uh, <clears throat> in fact, I was talking to Alex last week. And we were talking about dating services. I don't know how I'm getting off on this, but... And I'm not going to name any names, but, you know, uh, there's all these services that you can get online or whatever, and you can meet people, right? And so you fill out all these questions about your likes and dislikes and those kind of things, or answer these questions about yourself. And then other people do likewise, and then they try to match you up, right, with someone that would be compatible for you. And I was thinking about this, and I thought, you know, Meryl and I, we were attracted because we're opposites. We're not like each other. <laughs> and um, the truth is, opposites attract. And, it, you know, so it's kind of ironic to me that you're filling out all these things about somebody that's like you, and, and then you get somebody like you, and you don't really necessarily want somebody like you. Um, now, surely you have to have um, the same interests and hobbies and those kind of things. But when it comes down to personality traits, you'd be surprised how many people are attracted to the opposite of themselves. So if you're an extrovert, you may like an introvert, or vice versa. And, uh, but that's kind of the way God set up the world, and that there are great contrasts that exist. Um, for example, there's the contrast between light and darkness. There's the contrast between male and female, between hot and cold, good and evil, day and night, angels and demons, and the list goes on and on. And one of the greatest contrasts in the Bible is the contrast between man, Adam, and God. Right? There's a great contrast there. Uh, some great similarities because Adam was created in the image of God, in the likeness of God, but Adam was created lower than God, right? So there's a big gap between Adam and God, and yet there are similarities. I think of the two bands during the 60s, some of you were too young for that. But how many remember the, the group called the Beatles? <laughs> Rolling Stones? Uh, two bands that came out of England, but really to find a great contrast. Because the Beatles were these clean cut, at least they started out that way. I liked them in the earlier years. I debated this with one of my friends. And I told him I thought the music with the Beatles was much better in the earlier years than the later years. And he's told me, no, they actually got more talented in the later years. And he may be right about that. But I enjoyed them more in the younger years because they hadn't got into the drug scene as far as I knew. And I liked their little simple love songs. They were, they were great. So here's these clean cut guys. Uh, dressed in suits, remember? Fun-loving, you know, everybody loved it. The, the girls would just pass out, screaming at these guys, the four Beatles. Uh, and then you had this other group, the Rolling Stones. And they came out of England as well, about the same time. And they were these brooding, dark, they looked like a street gang, kind of. Um, and and uh, you wouldn't even think they were professional musicians. Uh, and so they each had their own genre of music. But they were quite a contrast, but they were both equally as popular. Now, I don't know which one's been more popular. I would probably lean a little more towards the Beatles, but the Rolling Stones are still playing. So here we see these contrasts that exist in the world. You say, Scott, what does it have to do with the Bible? Well, I'm trying to show you that the world is made up of differences and uh, opposites and contrasts. And when you look in the scripture, you see this happening in the Word of God. It's, it's so interesting. Uh, in the Christmas story, we see this contrast between two groups of figures that come together, uh, angels and shepherds. And I want to pinpoint out those contrasts and similarities, hopefully so that we might gather more revelation as to why God would tie in angels and shepherds together, because those are so uniquely different. Um, to us, oh, angels are kind of a mystery anyway, because the Bible says we can entertain angels unaware. I remember one time I was... Uh, working in construction, believe that, believe it or not, I did a little, a little painting and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm not really great at that, but um, I had just come off the end of the story I told about the brain surgery, and uh, I was recovering from brain surgery. I actually recovered really fast. I, I think my body recovers off things fast, so when I just recently had this little thing removed out of my chest, <laughs> um, <clears throat> the doctor was, it was, what day was that? Friday. Yeah, he took, he took the stitches out, right? Well, the stitches was a stitch. It was a piece of thread about this long, right? 
And he goes, you're going to feel a little tug. And I thought, but Christy had told me, Dad, you know, when I had mine removed, it kind of hurt. So, and, and I brought Casey in with me because I wanted him to look at something on Casey, which was fine. But anyway, and so, yeah, you're going to feel a little tug. And I, I went, a little tug? <laughs> this was one of the most painful things I've ever felt. I thought I might pass out. It hurt so bad. It was like, picture taking a fishing line with a hook on it, pulling it through your chest. That's kind of what it felt like. And, you know, he didn't say much, but I went, that really hurt, you know. <laughs> I'm glad you don't have to do that again. But anyway, so uh, maybe my body recovered fast, and he wasn't, I should have had those out sooner, probably. I don't know. Brain surgery. I recovered fast out of that. So I, I, I needed a job, and I got into construction. And I was working with this Christian group. That it was a, the guy that ran the company was a Christian. He was about my age. Uh, this was years ago. And... Um, it was really awesome because we'd come together and uh, we'd pray as a group of guys. There was probably about, I don't know, eight of us or something like that. And what they were doing was they were going into downtown Long Beach into the uh, inner city areas and redoing people's houses for them. It was amazing. It was a great, it was like, it was a ministry, but it was also a way that, that he made a living out of it. The city was funding these kind of things to, you know, to refurbish. And the people were so grateful because they got basically a new house. You know, new paint, new this, new that. So, I mean, they did all kinds of amazing things. And, you know, whenever God's people come together and there's a work of God, and this, I believe this, God's hand is really on this thing, um, the enemy comes to destroy that, to break it up. You know, when God is moving in a ministry uh, or in a group of people or, 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 or church, uh, the enemy doesn't like that because God's power is being expressed and people's lives are being changed and uh, the kingdom is alive, moving, living, right? And pulsating, and so the enemy will rise up to try to counteract that. Uh, and so, uh, but but before I tell you, finish the story. There was this one Hispanic fellow that was with us. He had joined the group, and uh, and he was doing painting and those kind of things. And I ended up working with him. It's kind of interesting. So there were hours where it was just me and him, right? And and we would talk about spiritual things. It was really weird. We talk about God and, and love and, and and the Bible. Um, and I remember one time I said, you know, I, I really want to be a pastor. And he said, he looked at me and said, you're already a pastor. You know, I was way back. I was, how old was I? I don't know. But early 20s, mid 20s, mid 20s. And, but it just, the things that he said seemed so profound to me. Long story short, the, the, the group kind of broke up and basically the guy fired us all. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I was going to go give this guy his check. The, 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 the this man that I worked with and I knew kind of where he lived and so I went over to this area to try to give him his check and they never heard of this guy. Nobody knew anything about him. Now I don't know to this day whether that was an angel or not. I don't know. It might have just been some guy. But um, it had a profound effect on me. So the Bible says we do entertain angels unaware. You may have been around an angel sometime in your life because angels can take on human form. Okay. And, and in all different shapes and forms, you know what I mean? So, um, who knows? Entertain angels unaware. But then, in this story, the angels appear in their, their supernatural form, right? And um, that can happen as well. That, I've, never, I've never seen an angel other than maybe that. But uh, this story is quite amazing. Now, I want to take a look at, um, let's go back to, we're still in Luke. And let's pick up the story of the shepherds and angels coming together. And the first question you might be asked, we're going to take a look again at verse 8. Um, why did God decide to allow shepherds to hear and see the angelic proclamation of Christ's birth? Um, that's an interesting thought. He could have, he could have had, visited anybody, right? Could have visited a king or queen. or he could, have, he could have visited the religious group. That makes sense. The scribes, the Pharisees. You know, Sadducees, that group, he could have come to them because they were the ones that knew the scripture. They knew there was Old Testament prophecies of a Messiah being born. Uh, and, and so it would seem most likely that God would appear to them. But he, he avoided them. And actually to their shame, really, because by visiting shepherds, uh, that would be the last people you think God would reveal his glory to and the proclamation of Christ's birth. And, and so, uh, once again, we see this avoidance of the religious people. A lot of people think, 
you know, God will move in a, in a very religious atmosphere. And the truth is, many times God moves in a very anti-religious atmosphere. In a place you would never think would happen, that's where God moves. And many times God speaks in a place you never think he would speak to you. And I know when I'm, a lot of times when I hear from the Lord, it's, it's, it, it, sometimes it's in church, but most of the time it's not in church. Uh, most of the time it's somewhere else, doing something else. And all of a sudden you, you hear the voice of the Lord, and God is speaking to you. And here we see these shepherds who, by the way, uh, sheep herding, uh, shepherding began, it's one of the oldest professions in the Bible, and it began with Abel. The Bible says Abel was a keeper of the flock. And so um, the first child born to Adam and Eve, Abel, was a, was a shepherd. That's kind of cool. And, but yet shepherds were kind of outcasts in society during this time. Because first of all, they were filthy. You know, I mean, you're out there with the sheep and the manure, if I can use the word, and all of that going on. And, and your clothes are, are tattered and, and you probably don't smell great. And they kind of avoided the city because they said this was a full-time job. Their job was to guard those sheep and protect them from wolves or from animal predators that would harm them. And so the shepherd guards and watches over his sheep. And just as a pastor in a church, part of my job is to guard and watch over the flock and to keep the flock safe from, you say, safe from what, Scott? Well, primarily from erroneous doctrines or things that would come in that would be harmful and would defile the scripture or lead people in the wrong direction. So a shepherd is to, is to teach and to lead and to feed, right? And also to guard and to watch over. So these shepherds um, were kind of outcasts and uh, they were not allowed, it's interesting, they weren't allowed to uh, really worship in the temple because they were defiled. And why were they defiled? because they didn't ceremonially wash. And remember that was a big issue with Jesus and the Pharisees because they said, why are your disciples eating without going through all the ceremonial washings? And, and, uh, and Jesus went on to say, you're hypocrites. You guys on the outward appear very religious. You do the right things on the outside, but on the inside, you're a, hip you're a hypocrite. You're, you're full of dead man's bones. You're the blind leading the blind. And, and so Jesus revealed the, the, the thoughts and intentions of their heart. Uh, so these religious people were not pure. They weren't real before God. And so they cast out the shepherds. They weren't allowed to uh, participate in, in, the, in the temple. And, and the, the, they worship in the temple. And so God found another way to reach these people. He came to them. Instead of them going to church or the temple, God came to them. Very interesting. On that wonderful night, the angels exploded on the scene with loud, I like this, loud, dynamic declarations of praise and worship that stunned the fearful shepherds into silence. I mean, let's just face it, they freaked out. If you were out there watching the sheep by night and all of a sudden the sky opens up and uh, first comes one angel and then comes a multitude of the heavenly hosts worshiping and praising God, you'd be freaked out. You'd be afraid. And, and uh, that's exactly the response. If you look in the Bible time and time again, whenever a person encounters an angel, usually the response is to be afraid, right? Because whenever we get into that realm of the unknown, there's a certain amount of uncertainty uh, uh, that, that exists. And, and we, we don't understand it. And it can cause people to be afraid. But we know when it's of God because God always says, fear not, right? God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power, love, and sound mind. Right? God doesn't want believers to be afraid. You know, uh, Fear cripples people. It keeps them from doing what they're capable of doing. And how many of us are tripped up by our fears? You know, And uh, God, time and time again, speaks to me through the word to fear not. Don't doubt. Don't fear. Just believe. Trust me. And the same is true in your life. To not give in to fear, but resist fear. Resist doubt and continue to believe God and his word. The angels were confident and the shepherds were fearful. Look at verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. So it began with one angel. Now, who was that angel? I don't know. But I, I would tend to think it might have been Gabriel. Because he, he's the one that appeared to Elizabeth and, he, and Zacharias, and he appeared to Mary. Um, 
So we don't know for sure, but this angel did appear. And uh, that's one angel's cool, you know, exciting, but that was just the beginning, right? Uh, and that said, the glory of the Lord shone around them. And I've always been fascinated by the she Shekinah glory. When I was in high school, after I got saved, <clears throat> Balmy Night in Palm Springs, California, age 14, um, I, I, I went, the first church I ever went to was this, this church in Long Beach. It was called Shekinah Fellowship or Shekinah Church. The word Shekinah is not in the Bible, but, but it's, it's a Hebrew word that defines the, the manifestation, the physical manifestation of the presence of God. And, uh, and so this church was called Shekinah, Shekinah Fellowship. And uh, that Shekinah glory appeared in the Old Testament in, in several occasions. Uh, God said he would dwell above the mercy seat between the two cherubim, and there the Shekinah glory dwelled. Uh, it's kind of like a shimmering mist. And I told you when I was in, I think probably in college then, when we were, I was praying with a friend in the car, and, and, and we opened our eyes after we prayed, and inside the car the glory was there, the Shekinah glory was there, and there was a mist in the car. It would be almost like you had fog inside your car, but it wasn't fog. And we both knew what it was, and we just kind of like, wow, it was weird, you know. And, um, but I believe God showed me that Shekinah glory because I think we're going to see it again in the church. I mean, we're going to see it with our eyes. Uh, and that glory is the manifest presence of God amongst his people. Isn't that what we want? God to manifest himself in our midst? To come and, and, and show up? I mean, we want God to show up in church, right? We don't want to just talk about him. We want to meet him. We, we want to experience it. And so if you read in the Old Testament, there were other occasions where the glory appeared. In one time when the temple was being dedicated, the priests couldn't even stand up because the glory came in and they fell over. Uh, you know, when human flesh comes in contact with the divine, human flesh gives way. When John, you know, the revelator, the apostle John, saw Jesus on the Isle of Patmos when he wrote the book of Revelation, he fell over like a dead man. And, and Jesus touched him and, and he came, he rose up again. But, uh, you know, like I told you, human flesh gives way to the divine. And in this case, with the angels, they, they were just struck with terror and fear. Uh, you know, never see anything like this in their life. Um, but, but the angels and shepherds shared one thing in common, even though they were totally different beings. Uh, one was supernatural, one was spiritual, the other was physical and, and very lowly. They both experienced overwhelming joy, overwhelming joy. And if I can get anything through to you for Christmas, the greatest thing you can experience for Christmas is not what comes under the tree, okay, or, or, or what you eat, uh, where you go, or who you're with. The best thing about Christmas is joy. If you can come in contact with joy, the spirit of Christmas, you've, you've, you've just blessed yourself greatly, right? And that's that, that's that mythical, uh, mysterious thing that we're all searching for during Christmas. Am I not right? I, I want to feel what I felt as a kid. Those feelings I felt as a child that were just so amazing around Christmas and, and, and Christmas morning, Christmas Eve. You know, some of my favorite times were Christmas Eve because it really wasn't about uh, presents. It was about really coming in contact with the true Christmas story, what it was all about, and Christ being born. But, but joy is the thing that eludes us sometimes during Christmas. In fact, some people get kind of depressed during Christmas. And I don't know if it's because... Their expectations are not met. You know, we tend to have great expectations. And when those aren't met, we get kind of bummed out. Or maybe we reflect about the year and where we've been and those kind of things. And things didn't go as good or whatever. But the, the joy is there for, for believers. And it's not about what you possess. It's about who you possess. And those two groups came together and experienced this bursting of joy, this overwhelming sense of, of, of happiness. Verse 10, the angel said, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. The Bible uses superlatives which are, you know, uh, overemphasizing something. You know, exceedingly great joy, right? Now unto him who is able to exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. Exceedingly abundantly. Boy, there's a superlative, a couple of them. Overemphasizing the greatness of God's joy. The greatness of his power. And, and so... Christmas is about joy. And I, I pray that this, sometime along the way, as we get close to that day, you'll come in contact with the joy of the Lord. The joy of Christ will arise in you. And, and you might just be 
driving along, listening to Frosty the Snowman. You know, who knows what you're doing, okay? And But all of a sudden, there's this feeling of joy. Wow, I feel good. I like Christmas. This is really cool. You know, oh, you mean Pastor God would bless Frosty the Snowman song? Absolutely. All of those songs are wonderful, you know? Uh, yeah, we love the sacred ones, but you don't have to just listen to those. You know, I, I've got the radio on all the time listening to Christmas music. I love it. Um, you know, I'm dreaming of a white. You know, I, mean, I, you know, I, I don't care what it's about. It's, it's the season, right? It's the feeling. And we want to feel good. And, and then when you feel good, guess what? You make other people feel good. But when you feel bad, you make other people feel bad. So we want to be expressions of God's joy. Now, you can't fake it, because if you fake it, then you're getting religious and weird. But if God visits you with his joy, receive it. Amen? It's a gift. And that's what he did with these shepherds. Supernatural joy. That's what I love. Don't be afraid, verse 10. For this, for verse 11, there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. You know, I like that. Because, yes, glory to God in the highest. I wish all people would give glory to God. They don't, but that's what we want to do. That's the goal, is that people would give glory to God, who is in the highest place. But notice, peace on earth and goodwill towards men. God wants to see people get along have goodwill towards each other, right? Uh, there's too many people fighting and battling and arguing and cutting people off on the freeway and doing all kinds of amazing things. And we're supposed to be goodwill towards men, right? We're supposed to be cordial and friendly and kind to people around us, to our neighbors, you know? Um, it's okay to say hi to your neighbor next door, you know? <laughs> uh, make contact with the people around you. Sometimes you tend to just go into your house and disappear. Um, but we are social creatures. I was thinking about that, thinking, why are we so connected with all this electronic stuff? You know, iPhones and computers and what do you call that? Instagram and I don't even know, instant messaging and all that stuff, texting and the list goes on and on. But what about uh, face plant? I mean, face, what's it called? Face, <laughs> impart face? No, where you talk face to face, FaceTime, yes, all those things, okay? Who knows where it's going? But what, why is that all going on? People want to connect. Think about it, don't they? That's what it's all about, connecting. Now, you may not be connecting with an audible, audible voice or you know, in person, which is the best way to connect, but you're still making connection. So we are social people. God made us that way, and we need connections in our life. We need to be with people. You have to. You, you'll, you'll fall apart if you aren't. They did a study. I think, now, this could be fictitious, but I heard they did a study with babies a long time ago. Russian, it was in Russia. And they wanted to see the impact of a baby not being touched. That's just awful. If they did that, that's just awful. But from my understanding, they died. Because when there's no touch, you, 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 your body can't exist. So it is so important that during Christmas you fellowship. And the best fellowship you can get is with other believers, right? Same fellows in a ship. Because you share Christ in common, right? And you share the Lord together. So that's why I love after our service. Don't run out too fast. I mean, we've got some nice little goodies, and we can fellowship. We can talk. We can, you know, discuss. You know, Kelly, what was that? You said, we live with um, people. Help me. Something. Anyway, the lowest kind of person is a person who talks about people. But small-minded people talk about people, right? You know, they gossip. Do you hear about so and so? Do you hear that? You know, let's get the dirt up on people, you know. Then average people talk about events. Did you see that? Did you watch that in the news, you know? But what great-minded people talk about ideas and how, how absolutely true that is. We don't talk enough about ideas, right? And that's probably the most important thing that you should talk about. And ideas carry over into theology. And, and the Word of God, and, and to spiritual truth and spiritual understanding. Those are all ideas, right? And concepts and, and so forth. Um, just a little tidbit, but I think that's absolutely true that you, we need to discuss more about ideas. That's how great creative minds, by the way, come up with things. I gotta think this. 
you know, you know our thing, Lighthouse, no religion, just life, right? Okay. I have to confess a little bit. I was inspired on that about something I saw. That it, it, well, I didn't steal it, but it was something that it, it, it led me in that direction. See, because whenever you create in life, you're always grabbing a little something from somebody else, right? A little creativity. Don't tell me that Jobs did all that on his own. He borrowed creativity from somebody else, right? That's how it works. You build upon one thing upon another. There was a movie called What Women Want. I'm not advertising that movie, but in the movie, at the very end, he comes up, was it him or was it her? No, it was her. Helen Hunt came up with this slogan, and it was, they were talking about Nike shoes, and they were trying to do it, it was a pitch campaign for Nike. And the little slogan was, Nike, sports, no, no games, just sports, right? And that struck me like, that's kind of cool, I like that. But nothing happened then. But later on, when God was showing me about our church and what it, the, 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 what it would develop into, dropped the the. That was the first thing I got. No, really, you know, because you know that social network movie, <coughs> the social network, he told, uh, what's his name, the dancer, Timberlake, told, um, what's the kid, Mark Zuckerberg, he said, just one tenth, drop the the, and he walked out. I was just great, you know, and so it was the Facebook, and now it became Facebook, and you know what, that's done, changed the whole world, it did. Uh, so anyway, I felt like the Lord, we were Lighthouse Christian Fellowship, and the Lord told me, drop the Christian Fellowship, just go with Lighthouse. And, you know, I find that we're really in the flow of things, because all of these other ministries are doing the same thing. They're shortening down their, could be Harvest, it could be Vineyard, it could be whatever, you can name them, they're, they're shortening it down, and so... You know, but I was just hearing from the Lord. I wasn't trying to keep up with the Joneses, you know. I remember I came up with, to know God and, and make him known. You now all of a sudden I saw that pop up on somebody else's site who's got a huge ministry. And I'm like, darn, he stole it. But anyway, so then I got this lighthouse. No religion, just life. And that became our slogan. So, but that's how creativity works. It builds upon things. And when you get something you know that comes from God, you just go, oh, that's it. It resonates, you know. And, uh, Kelly and I were, I'm getting off the subject, sorry, but Kelly and I were over at the sign company yesterday. And by the way, Tony, that was fantastic what you did on the sign. And it's interesting, you put in the, in the arrow, no religion, just life, right? Well, your friend Chrissy didn't have that in her arrow. And I was thinking, oh, Lord, I hope that's the right thing. Because again, some people can misunderstand what I'm talking about. You know, that, I, that they might not understand what I'm trying to communicate. But I felt like the Lord said, no, that's got to be there. That slogan has to be there. It's so important. This was not a religious event out in the hills of Bethlehem. It was a secular event, right? It was. It was like a football game, an NFL football game, except they were shepherding sheep. And out of nowhere, the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah glory comes. And an angel visits them. And then there's a, a multitude of angels worshiping and praising God and giving glory to God in the highest. And so sometimes the most unlikely places God shows up in your life. Look for that, expect that, and the most unlikely times he talks to you. And that's what happened with his angels, they were not prepared. These angels are heavenly messengers who come to warn, rescue, strengthen, and instruct. That's their purpose. They are meant to bless those that are inheritors of salvation. If you're a believer today, then you have an angelic personality in your life. There's, there's an angel that watches over you. When you drive, when you, you know, when you, wherever you are, when you're traveling, that angel's with you because it began when you were young. And so, praise God, we've got a divine messenger that we can't see that warns us, protects us, and, and, and instructs us in the way of God, in the way of salvation, in the way of the Word. And these angels not only showed up and said, look, Christ the Messiah is going to be born. They said exactly where you would be. See, God knows exact things about your life. And he said, they said, go to the city, go to Bethlehem, go to the manger, and there you'll see the babe lying there. In, it was more like a cave, probably. Uh, but they knew exactly where to go. And they went there, and let's read, and we're going to close with this. And they came with haste, verse 16, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. So when you come in contact with the true spirit of joy, 
true Christmas, guess what you're going to do? You're going to tell others. You're going to, you're going to express that joy. It's going to come out. You're going to be excited. You're, you're going to be motivated. And that's going to be a blessing to other people, right? And that's exactly what they did. They just went out and told it. They didn't have to have a, a, a you know ten week class on how to do this. Bam! They just went. They experienced the joy, and they began to tell other people. The baby's born. The Messiah has been born. The one that's been prophesied thousands of years ago has come, and he's born right here in Bethlehem. The King, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, born as a baby in Bethlehem. Let's pray.